Hi, I'm Joe Grasso, and this uh, was my attempt at an indie lab about damped pendulums, because that's how it is in real life. Um, so the premise, my slides are going to be pretty sparse, I like to talk. Um, so again, the premise of my lab was the damping of pendulums, dampening, I actually get confused on that, even though it was my lab. Um, the damping of pendulums, uh, which is just the decay of their motion over time. They don't, con they don't maintain all their energy because there are things like friction at the top of the rope and drag by whatever's hanging at the bottom of the rope or string. I didn't really use a rope. Um, so the purpose of my lab was to study the nature of the decay of, decay of motion in a pendulum and to study what was making it lose energy. Um, basically, my hypothesis then was that... Um, the main thing that would cause the pendulums to lose energy, um, actually, uh, well, was the uh, drag caused by whatever hung at the bottom of the pendulum. Um, and so the way I decided I would test that, um, well, I'll just go ahead and do a quick thing of like the setup. Basically, I just took the cover off of my ceiling light and tied a string to it, and then taped a protractor behind that, and then I had a really long string, and a mass at the end of it that was made out of Play-Doh. Um, and uh, I just went from there. Uh, so here are some pictures. This is the uh, protractor with the lamp. I also, I, I took data using a video. I just taped my phone to the top of my ceiling. It's really difficult. Um, I probably could have found a better way to do it. This is a picture of one of my masses that I fashioned <coughs> by hand. What's so funny? <laughs> <laughs> Plato is useful. That's a terrible photograph. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's from a video. Okay. Uh, um, I guess I didn't put a sign in here about this, but basically what, the way I tested um, you know, different drags was I uh, had a sphere, or close to a sphere, what, however close I could get with my hands, and then a cube, or however close I could get to a cube with my hands, because a cube has a really high, much higher drag coefficient than a sphere. Um, and so what I did was I you know, raised it up to an angle, and this is where the first problem comes in, because I started at 10 degrees and then went up from there, um, and that just kind of made my data all really inaccurate. Um, so this was my uh, data, um, and I don't know why this, I shouldn't have put this graph on here, I meant to put the uh, current angle versus time, but it is the same graph, um, because as you know, the period of a pendulum is constant, so it's basically the same graph, just over seconds instead of n. But I mean, as you can see here, it looks clearly very linear. Um, and there is a sort of oscillation above and below the line, but it's pretty consistent. Um, and so I was confused about that because naturally, you know, pretty sure it's not linear. Um, but just to avoid any sort of pre preconceptions, I wanted to look at that seriously. Um, and so the slope would have to be in terms of some constant that you could multiply by the current angle to find the angle of like the next swing. Um, and it's not, that doesn't really work out. Also, any data points that I took, I took like <coughs> sort of I separate graphs for each angle because it takes a lot of time for each one. And each graph would have to have the same slope and they didn't. And that didn't really make sense to me. Um, but I'm going to discuss that later. But So it's clearly not linear. Um, all points have a graph of a different slope. Um, and you can, you know, but you can clearly see that that's incorrect. So we know that that was incorrect. Um, my lab was basically a failure. But um, that allows me to discuss failure. Um, the two possibilities for the sketchy setup um, I didn't use a real protractor, I used a printed out protractor. Um, I used a lot of tape, um, 
I see a lot of hands on foreheads right now, specifically <coughs> Dr. Schuster's, but, um, you know, I noticed that as the pendulum would swing, it actually pulled the lamp, or not the lamp, the ceiling light, a little bit to one side and a little bit to the other, which I found could be a big problem. Um, the direction of the swinging of the pendulum and the uh, actual plane of the protractor were never quite parallel to one another. Um, all that contributed to things. Um, I did get some actually, I think, useful <laughs> data, but still kind of wrong as far as the cube versus the sphere. Um, the slope of the graph for the cube, um, as you can see, was larger, about 1.5 times larger, or well, yeah, larger, I guess, but more negative, um, which means that it was losing more energy uh, each time, uh, or each uh, swing, uh, than the sphere, which is what I expected. You know, naturally, there's more drag, um, which is going to slow down more. So we did learn that much, but I didn't get to do a lot of mathematical analysis on it because these aren't lines, and all of my data were ridiculous. Um, but uh, I still do believe that my hypothesis in part one was probably correct. It, actually, we know that it is. It does follow a sort of uh, exponential-like decay, at least in certain conditions. Uh, but the data were so bad, um, basically, yeah. But what is interesting uh, about why my data were so incorrect was I decided to come at this lab from a, and I, this seems kind of stupid, but I decided to come at this lab from a point of ignorance so that I could learn as much as possible, which is what I often try to do with some labs in this class. But the difference is those labs are kind of set up for you as a learning process, um, and that didn't really work out here. Um, and I think it would have been much better to have come at this type of lab, uh, an independent lab, from a, a position of actually knowing all the mathematics of what I was trying to do. I was trying to recreate the experience of not knowing the equations, or perhaps not knowing them very well, and learning them as I went along. But I found that it's just impossible <coughs> to create a lab that actually tests these things. Because if I had known about, say, the small angle uh, theorem or whatever, I wouldn't have tried to go all the way up to angles of 40 degrees and get, you know, uh, graphs that were just wildly inaccurate and just really didn't work in the way I was trying to have them work. Because this lab kind of relies on the idea that a pendulum is in simple harmonic motion. And that's just really not true for a lot of the angles I tested. Um, and it's hardly true for the smallest ones that I did, and that's why I have very little graphs and really no numbers on this presentation. So, you know, basically just as a lesson, come at an indie lab from a, a place of enlightenment and not from a place of ignorance. Hello. Uh, I'm wondering if the oscillation of the lamp itself could introduce like a beat frequency dependence that you're seeing in your earlier graph. That's actually what I thought. I didn't talk about that, but you know that's that's what makes sense. Um, especially, uh, I started thinking about it later on when we were doing things in this class that had a lot of conflicting frequencies that were doing that sort of thing. I realized what that was. Time for one more question. If there's one. Go ahead. Um, just a question about the thing we were talking about at the end. Um, if you go into every indie lab with a sense of enlightenment, as you called it, um, I mean, how are you to discover new things? Like, how would you approach discovering new things if everything you're learning is already learned? Um, that's a good question. Uh, and what I would say is to understand everything you can about a lab, then do some sort of experimentation to fully sort of rigorously round out your understanding of what already exists, and then do things that haven't been done and see how what you understand applies to that situation. <coughs>
That is a heck of a way to close. Thank you. Like and subscribe.